Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord is good, isn't he? Yes. It is so good to be in church. <laughs> I was watching Pastor online and the preacher was good, but I said if we were in the sanctuary, it would have been gooder. <laughs> Amen. But I thank God for being here today. Today I'm going to speak to you on the topic, you will see your consolation. You will see your consolation. And the text comes from Joel chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, and verses 8 and 10. And Joel says, If only my anguish could be made, and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely obey the sand of the sea. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me the thing that I long for. Then I will still have my consolation. I rejoice in unrelenting pain that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. So Job, in verses 2 and 3, describes what he was going through. And he uses what we would call exaggeration to say, to say that if all that he was going through could be made on scales, it would be more, the weight of what he was carrying, the, the depth of the suffering that he was experiencing, that it would be more than the sand of the seashore. But the one thing Job had was his consolation, hallelujah. And that is what God wants to minister to you about this morning. And so Job chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 tells us that Job was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. In other words, when the Bible says that Job feared God, it meant that he obeyed. He respected and submitted himself to the Lordship of God and his perfect will for his life. He shunned evil. That means he walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners or gossipers, nor sat in the seat of evil men. Wherever there was evil or whatever looked like evil, Job shunned it. So he tells me if he were going down the road and he saw a group of people that he knew were carnal or were unsaved, he took a different path because he did not want to be called into whatever was going on. And God took notice of it, just like the Lord is looking at each of us and he's recording and taking notice of how we live. What we say, what we watch on our cell phones and, and iPads and things like that. And so John chapter 1 also makes known that because John lived holy, because John served the Lord, that God blessed him. The Bible tells us he had seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys and a large number of servants. It also makes known that Job was the richest man among all the men in the East during his lifetime. So because Job lived such an exemplary life, God blessed him in a manner that people would see what God does for the righteous. When you live right, the apostle says uh, he wants us to prosper and in be of good health uh, even as our souls prosper. God wants the church to prosper. Now that doesn't mean that everybody is going to be a millionaire or a thousandaire, but your needs are going to be met. Uh, God is a good shepherd. He's our God that promises that he will provide all of our needs. Uh, but God knew what he was doing when he blessed Job because there are some people that God God can bless and still find them in church. There's some people that God can bless and still maintain their testimony and their humility. And in spite of all the wealth and the notoriety that John had, he lived and he served God and God calls his name to be known. In Job chapter 1 verses 13 to 19, it tells us that Job experienced Every conceivable tragedy and misfortune in one day that most people might encounter in a lifetime. In one day, everything that could go wrong went wrong for Job. And remember, he was still holy, he was still fearing God, he was still walking upright. But the day came that, in spite of that, everything went wrong. Verses 
verses 6 and 7 also makes known uh, that there was also a day when the holy angels presented themselves before the Lord to give him an account of the, their assignments in the earth. And that Satan came along among them and God asked him, where have you come from? Hallelujah. The Lord's question implied that Satan's busyness is selfish. It is reckless and has no connection with him. This is confirmed in Mark chapter 8 verse 33 where Jesus rebuked Satan by saying to him, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And so God knew that what Satan was up to had nothing to do with advancing the gospel. It was a rhetorical question. He knows all things. He knows the end at the beginning. Where have you come from, Satan? And Satan answered God and said, I have come from Roman through the earth. I've been going back and forth in it. Um, the historians tell us that Satan response signifies hurrying rapidly to and fro throughout the earth. In other words, there's only one Satan. He can only be in one place at a time. So he hurries to get to Russia, you know, to see what is going on there, what evil he can plan. And then he has to hurry from there to get to Australia while God is at any hour. He fills all things. He's the omnipresent God. He's a new creation international church in New York. And he's in Boston, Massachusetts. And he's in the Caribbean. He's all over the world. And so Satan has to hurry. I can see him like a man but just rushing up and down and to and fro on the earth trying to find out what you are doing and what I am doing and what the people of God are doing. This is the reason why Peter tells us uh, that we've got to be sober and vigilant uh, because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion walks about uh, seeking whom he may devour. And then Satan comes into a church or he sends uh, his demons into a church to investigate it. Uh, they are always looking for the weak, uh, those who are weak in their faith, uh, that they can launch an attack, uh, or those who are alert in the scriptures, uh, that they can be deceived. Uh, that's why we've got to read the word, uh, and we've got to keep our faith and hope and trust uh, and confidence in God, uh, because they're looking for those uh, that they can easily devour. Hallelujah. One translation said that Satan sneaks around uh, to find someone to attack. Uh, the Amplified Version says he's seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Uh, the, the Living Bible tells us he's looking for some victim uh, that he can tear apart. Uh, and so whenever Satan launches an attack, uh, it is always to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The Septuagint translator, what's the, what the Lord said to Satan, it says, uh, what Satan responded to the Lord, it says that he had gone round the earth uh, and walked over all that is on the heaven, and now I have come thither. The child, he says, uh, I am come from going round the earth to examine the works of the children of men uh, and from walking through it. Uh, Miles Coverdale says, I have gone about the land uh, and walked through it. Uh, another translation says, from walking around the earth uh, and walking about it. Uh, so at the time that Satan presented himself before the Lord, uh, he had gone through the entire planet earth uh, looking for whom uh, he may devour. He says, uh, I've been examining uh, the works of the children of men. Uh, it means he was looking at uh, uh, how unrighteous and depraved and iniquitous uh, and vile and abominable uh, those who he had convinced uh, to, to reject God had become. Uh, and he was also looking at the righteous uh, because it is clear that he was watching Job. Uh, and after Satan said all of that to the Lord, uh, the Lord said to him, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, there is no one on earth like him. Uh, he is blameless a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan replied, Does John fear God for nothing? You have put a hedge around him, a 
Nebuchadnezzar, he will surely curse you to his face. Say, just made that statement because he was able to get many to curse God for one reason or another. He was able to get many uh, who were serving God faithfully and things that don't go well uh, to backslide and to declare that God is not good. Uh, hallelujah. So the Lord said to Satan, very well, that everything he has is in your hands. Uh, all of his properties, uh, all of his flocks and herds and servants and children. Uh, but do not lay a hand uh, on the person or the body uh, of Job. Uh, because he said to God, uh, Job is only serving you uh, because you have given him all that he had. Uh, and God said, okay, well go and destroy everything uh, that I have given to Job, uh, but do not touch his body. Uh, and so Satan left the presence of the Lord uh, to carry on what he always wanted to do to Job. And so sometime after Satan got permission to inflict suffering on Job, he launched an attack on his family, killing all his children but not his wife. He killed all his servants, all his sheep and cattle and yoke and oxen and donkeys. There was nothing that God had given to Job that Satan did not destroy. And he was sure that once he did this to Job, that Job would have done like others and cursed God and die. But when this happened, the Bible tells us that Job fell to the ground and he worshipped God. Hallelujah. That shocked Satan. He wasn't expecting worship. He was expecting a murmuring and a complaining. But even though God had done mighty miracles in Egypt, when the children of Israel got into the wilderness, he was among the children of Israel. And he got them to murmur and to complain and to declare that God could do nothing. As a matter of fact, the children of Israel got so rebellious that they demanded that God prove himself, that God worked a miracle. They said that God had brought them to kill them in the wilderness because there were not enough prayers in Egypt. And they said what they wanted to say. They even demanded another God. And Aaron made a golden calf. But when God touched Job, as the book of Job is one of the oldest books in the collection of the book
He was at home when the news came that everything he had was gone. You see, Job's response to his tragedy can be compared to what Joseph said to his brothers who were afraid that he was going to kill them after their father had died. Joseph said to his, said to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Joseph recognized that there was a purpose for the pain. Joseph understood that if God didn't do it that way, his father would not have released him and they would have all died from the famine. Glory to God. Job realized that God was the most important thing because what God has done in the past, he can do in the present. He can perform in the future. Whatever you've had before, you will get it again. All you've got to do is continue to worship God in spirit and in truth. Continue to bless his name. Continue to give him glory. Continue to magnify him. Even when others think that you're stupid and they're wondering what do you have to praise God for.
In spite of the emotional pain he was experiencing in his soul, he trusted God because he was sure, he was confident that he was going to see the consolation of the Lord. He had a confidence that God was going to remedy the situation. Where is your faith this morning? Do you have any consolation? Do you have any expectation from the Lord? In Job chapter 13, verses 15 to 16, he says, Even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He also shall be my salvation. Job said, If God is doing this thing, if God thought it just and righteous to do this to me, I'm going to trust God in my pain. I'm going to trust God in my anguish. I'm going to trust God with all this break out and in my body I'm going to trust God when the inflammation and the pus is causing pain in my body Job says I am going to trust him if God is doing this I trust him he is my salvation he's my deliverance he's my healer he's my prosperity he's my health he's my joy and rejoicing In Job 19, 25 to 27, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. I shall see God and not another. How oh, my heart yearns within, within me. Another translation says, uh, I will see him with my own eyes. I myself, not someone else, will see God. And I cannot tell you how excited that makes me feel. It takes real faith uh, to express uh, emotions and sentiments like this uh, when everything is going wrong. Uh, you can't even go in the house uh, and lie in the bed with your wife. Uh, you are outside by the Ashiba. Uh, day and night, uh, I could picture his wife uh, just putting the food according uh, to, to, to the law when you were um, sick like that. Uh, you were declared unclean. Uh, and so to keep herself clean, uh, she might just put it a little distance uh, where he has to reach out and get it. Uh, there are no more servants. Uh, but in all of that, Job says, uh, I know that my Redeemer lives uh, and I will see God. Uh, I will see him and not another. He's not still wanting to see my God and he doesn't want to see Gabriel uh, or any other angel. Uh, he says, I'm going to see God. Uh, But 
believers that will trust him in the midst of the storm. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you've got to believe that God is with you and that God is going to bring you out. The word consolation defined means comfort. Alleviation of misery or distress of mind. Refreshment of mind and spirit. Having happiness in suffering or misfortune. My God, I got to say it right there. Once I write and say, some folks ask me how I can smile. Even though I'm going through trials, they wonder how can I have a song when everything is going wrong. Uh, but I don't worry and I don't fret. Uh, God has never failed me yet. Uh, troubles come from time to time. Uh, but that's all right. Uh, I am not the worrying kind because uh, I've got confidence. Uh, I am secure and firm in my faith uh, because God uh, has never failed me yet. Uh, and no matter what the case may be, uh, I know God is going to fix it for me. Uh, is there a believer this morning uh, under the sound of my voice uh, that will rise up out of your lordly power, uh, out of your place of desperation? Uh, stop trying to figure out uh, how things are going to unfold for you. Uh, what your future and what your tomorrow is going to be like and begin to trust God. We have been so conditioned to having a job that we can't see life without a job. We can't see our needs being met without a job. No, I'm not bashing jobs, but a job is just a channel. A job is not your source. God is your source and sustainer. There are many people out there without jobs, with jobs rather, and they have money galore, but they don't have what you have this morning. Hallelujah. Every believer should have a joy, unspeakable and full of glory. You should have a confidence within you that in spite of what we are hearing in the news, double mass and double danger and more deaths that the resurrection and the life is on the inside of you that you can't die unless God says your time is up we are under a new and better covenant we expect the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ as we do our part we expect to survive COVID-19 unemployment financial ruin difficulties because there is a hope in God. Consolation also means salvation and getting the promises God made to you. In the end, Job sought the consolation of the Lord. He was comforted by God and his ministry came to a complete end. He got double wealth. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 100 female donkeys, restoration of a large number of servants. He got back his 10 children and a changed wife, and his life was extended to see four generations of his descendants. I am sure when God did that, that Satan regretted that he had touched the man of God. My God have mercy in Zion. That's why Jesus said to Martha, did I not say to you that if you believe that you will see the glory of God? What am I saying at this time? I am saying to you that the Lord has permitted the enemy to touch you because he wants to give you double for your trouble. God wants to use your life as a living testimony for the unsaved to see that there's no God like Jehovah. Hallelujah. God will have to give you sorrow to bless you, but he uses it. My God of mercy and Zion. So if the Lord has given the enemy permission to touch you, to touch your finances, to touch your marriage, to touch your children, he's going to regret it. He's going to regret it. For every time the devil touches a child of God, God makes his face a shame. All you've got to do is worship God and praise God and give God all the honor, the glory that is due to his name. May the devil regret the day that he walked into your home or came out 
God bless Job. And those who criticize him uh, and said he had done wrong, uh, Job offered uh, a sacrifice for God to receive them. Uh, don't mind what people are saying. Uh, sometimes God will cause you to be a Lord, uh, and then he will allow you to be downsized. Uh, worship God nonetheless. Uh, Paul says a man's life does not consist uh, in the abundance of things. Uh, if you only have joy uh, because you are in your apartment, uh, Yeah. 
receive? What is my time doing for me? What is my offering doing for me? I saw into the life of the man and the woman of God of sown seed. What is it doing for me? And we allow ourselves to become like Asaph and say we are serving God for nothing. But the thing about Asaph is after he has said all of that in his home, after he had uttered the murmur and the regret in his heart, he said, I went in to the house of God. He had a prayer meeting. He had a coming back to Jesus encounter. He had a visitation from God. And in that visitation, God showed him his consolation and showed him the end of the millionaire. My God of mercy, showed him the end of the wicked. He came back to his right mind. He began to say, listen, I went mad for a moment. Only a mad man was saying the things that I have said. He said, the Lord is my salvation. He's my provider. He's my healer. He's my all in all. He says, the unsaved don't even know the dangers that are lurking. They're walking on slippery paths. But the psalmist said, he has set our feet in an evil place. I come to tell you this morning that if you will keep your faith and trust in God, you will see your consolation. God will perform the thing that he said he would. He has an exact date and an exact time to do it. But when he comes, will he find faith? Will God find faith or doubt and believe? Many of us have children who have gone astray. We, we pray for others whose children have not sinned and all. Haven't come to the Lord as yet. But when the enemy touch our children, oh my God, we figure that God is obligated, you know, to keep our children okay. Keep them saved all the time. But you don't know the child that you give birth to. God knows the heart. Sometimes our children are just doing what we want them to do until they get 18 and then they tell you, I never wanted to go, but I had to go. But there's a consolation. Mothers, fathers, there is a consolation that your children will come back. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31, 15 to 17, Thus said the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children. Rachel is typology for every mother refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus said the Lord, refrain your eyes from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded, said the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, said the Lord, that your children shall come back to their border. There is a consolation that our backsliding and our unsaved sons and daughters will come to the Lord and come back to the Lord. God doesn't want mothers and fathers walking around depressed or with a grief lump. He wants us to move forward in faith, knowing that our consolation, we shall receive it. I've talked to many mothers that are ashamed and embarrassed to do ministry because their children are no more in the Lord. And I remember the Lord saying to me, every man pays for his own sin. What a person does has nothing to do with you. There is a consolation this morning. The Bible has given a word that the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. My God of mercy in Zion. There's consolation. It doesn't matter how long it takes. You've got to have faith in God for where iniquity abound. The grace of God abound much more. Just continue to cover them in prayer. Just continue to fight the good fight of faith. Over 21 years ago, my son was 21 at the time. He told me he was going somewhere and I told him he couldn't go. So he felt that he was a big man, he was going to do it. 
So I went and I got the bell. So when I went and I got the bell, anybody who knows my son, he's six feet five, he's always, always tall. And I was smaller than this. So as I got the bell when I was coming back, the Lord said to me, where are you going? I said to me, you know. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, you can't beat him now. He's not a child. He's grown. His spirit is grown. He says, but you still have legal right in the spirit, right? He said, just as a parent would do anything to raise a child, be walking the cold and the sun, whatever danger, whatever difficulties we would do to make sure our children are all right. He said, you have all legal rights in the realm of the spirit pertaining to your son. So I put down the bed and I picked up a wall of fear. And I began to attack the forces of darkness aggressively. And that plan that the enemy had, it was destroyed that same day. My son was so angry, he didn't really talk to me for a month. And when he couldn't take it anymore, he said, Mommy, you pray, right? And I said, yes. He said, I know it. I know you pray. Because it didn't happen. The girl never came. The girl never came. You will see your consolation. Don't be dumb hearted, Cheryl. Begin to pray. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. They're going to come. It doesn't matter how many tattoos they put on their bodies, how many piercings they put on their bodies, how many colors they put in their hair, how many tomorrow in their sons that they put on, how much half naked they dress, and their pants raised down by their knees. You've got to look beyond. I recognize this morning uh, that you've got a consolation, uh, you've got an expectation uh, that for God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son uh, that whosoever, your sons and daughters, uh, your nieces and nephews, uh, your godchildren, uh, your brothers and sisters, uh, your aunts and uncles, uh, your godmother, every family member, every unsaved person. God lays upon your heart, there will come in because Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice that God sent for the redemption of mankind. There's a consolation, there's a consolation, there's an expectation. My God have mercy, even in these difficult times. When money is scarce, you have a consolation. Are you hearing me? God is going to provide for you. God is going to bring you out. Hallelujah. I was talking to a friend and she said to me, this, this month then is a difficult one. I need some extra money to take care of some bills. And I said, the only person you have is God. There's no husband, no mother, no father, no child or children, nothing on the bank. We don't know how God is going to do it, but we trust God to do it. And I heard the testimony yesterday. She got it. She got her consolation. We put our faith in God. She trusted God. She cried out to God. She prayed it out. Why are you going to worry about money when the silver and the gold belong to God? When God is your Jehovah Jireh, He's your provider, He's your source and sustainer. Whatever you want, whatever you need, God will provide it. In Psalm 5, verse 12, it says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. Hallelujah. In Psalm 31, 19, it says, Oh, how great is your goodness that you have laid up for those who fear you, that you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. What the psalmist is saying, right now in your need, God has already provided exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And people are going to see it in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you are going to be driving in 2021, you're going to be driving to church in your vehicle. That's the goodness that God has laid up. Some of you are going to get increases in finances by job or otherwise. That's the goodness that God has laid up. And people are going to see it, especially the women. Men will continue in the same old suit, but a woman has to get a new wig and a new dress and pocketbook and jewelry and that kind of stuff. You can always tell when a woman hit the jackpot. She changed her eyeglasses and every kind of stuff. All of a sudden she has new nails and long nails. Hallelujah. That's the goodness that God has laid up. That's 
natural consolation, but you've got to trust God. You've got to keep your faith in God. Because when God does as he says, everyone will see it. I love God. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. It is real faith to believe God that the best is yet to come after a divorce. My God, have mercy. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 says, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. When I first came across that scripture, I couldn't figure it out. Because I was in that place of heart. And I'm saying, God, how can this be better than that? But the love was sweet. When love is sweet, it real sweet. Huh? When love is sweet, it put a smile on your face. You might put me hair on your body like Sister Joan. When love is sweet, it's sweet. And now they know love. And this thing is hard for me. You say, this is the better part. My God, have mercy. I couldn't understand it until God goodness came. And then I realized, hallelujah, that the end of a thing is better than that thing. Because whatever is ungood for you, God is going to release you from it. Are you hearing me? It may not be a marriage, but some kind of relationship. Whether it's a platonic relationship or sister, sister. Sometimes God has to disconnect. Because he wants to bring a better friend, one that would encourage you to serve God, one that would encourage you to put your faith and to trust in God. And sometimes when you will do it, God will get the person to drop you like a hot potato. And you're praying, God, she don't love me no more. God is my Christian brother, but God is saying the end of this thing is better than the beginning of that thing. Because the best is yet to come. Personality can 
people are lying on you, you will see your consolation. God is going to vindicate you. Hallelujah. It is real fair to hold on to God when your visa is denied. It is real fair. When your visa is denied or when you don't have any hope of applying. And you've got to remember that God will not withhold anything good from them that walk upright. He's not going to withhold you. Whatever is for you, God will give you in time and in season. Just wait on God. Just trust God. Just do like Job, live holy and love God for who He is. And not only because of what He can do. You can use God like a magician. God is looking for saints that love God on the basis that He is God. I love the song we say, one God, one word. One lamb, one sacrifice, one light of the world, one God who is great, hallelujah. We serve a God that is dependable. Are you hearing me this morning? We serve a God that does not fail, cannot fail, and will not fail. And so God is saying to each of us today, you will see your consolation, but you have to trust me. John said it. John said it in the text. He said that my anguish could be laid and all my misery can be placed on the scales. It will surely obey the sand of the sea. My God, he says, uh, oh, oh, that I might have my request. That God will grant me the thing that I long for. He wanted his consolation. He was believing that God was going to do something about his situation. He said, then I will still have my consolation my expectation. I rejoice in unrelenting pain that I have not denied the words of the Lord. Have you denied that God is Lord and warned you or not? Then you go over your text messages, your voicemails and emails, your conversations, your posting on social media. Have you denied the Lord? Because sometimes we don't outright deny him but the things we say convey the idea that God is not good for me. And if there's one thing that I don't ever want to do, it's to make God look bad in the eyes of a person. To make him look like if he's not a good provider. He is a good provider. Stand with me please in the presence of Each of us are aware. Each of us is aware of what we are going through. And God is not negating the fact that sometimes it is difficult. It is more than you can bear. But the cross you are carrying, only you can carry that cross. Nobody can bear the burden that is your love this morning, only you. But the reason why we press on and we walk on to the storm and walk on to the night is that we know we shall see our consolation. You've got to know as a Christian today that you will see your consolation. Whatever is hurting you, whatever is distressing you, you will see your consolation. God has not forgotten you. He said, he at the emblem this morning that reminds us of the cross. Jesus Christ took care of everything. And the Bible tells us that if God so freely gave us Jesus Christ, will he not also in him give us all things? He is so horrible. The words that are this morning is that you will see your consolation. You've got to know it. You've got to know it. You've got to know it. If you've been denied, you're going to still see your consolation because God promises that He will not before anything good from them that walk upright. Faithful is He that has promised. I want to pray for you today in closing. 
all for us grace to hold on and to trust in in what you're going through. Just raise your hands. I want to pray that you see your consolation. I want to pray for those who are undocumented this morning that it will happen. Don't try to figure out how God is going to do it. And don't put your eyes on man. Look to God and God alone. Those of you that are concerned about how you're going to keep a roof over your head and take care of your household. Those of you who are in need of prayer, be honest before God. This is not the time to put on the show, but the power of God is present to heal and to deliver because whenever God sends a word, it is to heal the situation. And God is saying, you will see your consolation. You will be healed. You will be Job said, I rejoice because I have a consolation that I will see them. Father, this morning, you see your praise hands and hearts. You see the lives of those that are looking. 